Good morning and welcome to the 19th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. Feels like we've never been away. Um, can I ask everybody in the public gallery to switch off any electronic devices so that they don't affect the sound system? Um, item one is declaration of interest and I welcome our new member, Bill Bowman, um, to the committee and invite him to make any relevant declarations of interest. Uh, thank you, Convener. I would refer to my register of interest in particular. Um, I'm a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland and a former partner in KPMG. Thank you very much, Bill. Okay, item two is decision on taking business in private. Um, and do members agree that we should take item four in private? Okay, we're also asked to consider our work programme um, in private at a future meeting. Members will recall we had an informal session over the summer um, and we want to consider the various suggestions that arise from that as well as the suggestions for post-legislative scrutiny um, for which I thank all those people who made a submission to the committee. Um, do members agree to take this area of work in private at a future meeting? Great. Great, thank you very much. Item three, Common Agricultural Policy Futures Programme, um, and we'll take evidence on the Auditor General's report. And I welcome to the committee Liz Ditchburn, who is the Di Director General of Economy, and Eleanor Mitchell, Director of Agriculture and Rural Economy, both from the Scottish Government. Um, could I invite an opening statement from Liz Ditchburn? Thank you very much, Convener. Good morning, everyone. Eleanor and I, uh, Eleanor, I always have difficulty saying your name. Eleanor and I welcome the opportunity to talk to you again today, some nine months since we last gave evidence to this committee. You will, I'm sure, have questions about what's happened since then and in response to the Auditor General's update report, and I look forward to answering them. I'll try to capture some summary headlines in this opening statement. The committee has, as members will know, been receiving detailed monthly reports on progress since January. I would like to start, however, by again putting on record my thanks to two groups of people. Firstly, to Scotland's farmers, crofters and other rural businesses for their continued patience during this challenging period. And secondly, to all staff for their dedication, determination and tenacity in seeking to put the cap payment system onto a more stable footing and to make this system work as we would want it to work. When I gave evidence before you this time last year, we had just come through the intensity of the June payment deadline and were still within the penalty-free period offered by the European Commission. We were seeking to maximise payments before the 15th of October deadline. I had started to make changes in the senior leadership team and we had made the first changes in governance and processes. But when Eleanor and I returned in December, together with the permanent secretary, the full depth of the challenge and the cumulative impact of the difficulties experienced in previous years were becoming ever more apparent. There have been some positive and important developments since then, as I think the Audit Scotland report acknowledges. However, despite this, 2016 payments started later than we had originally intended, squeezing the period in which the bulk of the payments needed to be made. We reached 90% of payments by value at end June, falling short of the target. You will rightly want us to hold us to account for our approach and our actions over this period. You may be asking why, if we had been doing the right things, there was not more improvement in the headline payment performance number. Let me try and answer that in summarising what has changed over the last year. First, some positives. Elements of performance have improved. The application window performed well, closed on time, and the percentage of online applications increased to 78%. Payment performance after June, in effect on the hardest 10% of cases, has been significantly better. The latest data shows that we've now made over 99% of our payments by value. Payment letters now go out at the time of payment. And we offered loans to farmers earlier making loan payments from November and giving cash flow certainty. And critically, the way we are operating has improved too. Our new governance arrangements are working well. We've made significant changes in the leadership team. Effective operational working processes, such as regular control room meetings, are now the norm, enabling us to track progress and take corrective action quickly. We have more and better data, management information and reporting to inform our decisions. We have more focused disciplines around software releases and IT delivery, and quality is improving with reducing numbers of defects. Communication and engagement with staff has improved, including through daily meetings and visits by a range of staff to area offices, and Eleanor, for example, has now visited all area offices. And finally, with the technical assurance review, we have now bottomed out the underlying challenges in the system. But there were other factors that meant we did not make the progress we hoped for. We'll be happy to talk in more detail, but in summary, 
The whole 2016 processing year started later due to the, I must say, very welcome extension of the penalty-free period and the earlier extension to the application window, but this pushed the whole time frame forward. Land changes. While the 2015 payments were being processed, the day-to-day -day updating of land changes was minimised. To make 2016 payments, we then had to process and validate significantly more land changes than expected. Next, the dynamic nature of the system. Because 2015 is the base year for entitlements, the 2015 application has to be, in technical terms, what's called at ready-to-pay status before the 2016 payment can be made. Even small changes can knock this out, and this added complexity was new to area office staff who had to deal with clearing the anomalies. And finally, we continue to suffer from some delays in IT delivery with slippage in critical elements of functionality impacting on our ability to make payments. Some of these issues were known to us last year, but the scale and impact of them was perhaps less understood. So again, you may ask, what are we doing to avoid a repetition of this experience? We continue to make improvements in the way we work, and Eleanor will want to tell you much more about this. We're responding to the recommendations in the Technical Assurance Review. We're responding to the Audit Scotland recommendations. Critically, we're looking to get ahead with 2017 requirements uh, through, for example, parallel working on different elements and we're starting to tackle the longer-term strategic issues as well as the short-term demands. But we are not complacent, and none of this is easy. Thank you for your time in listening, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps I might kick this session off by asking you about financial penalties, because I note from um, the papers we've received that you'd made something like 90% of payments by the 1st of July. Um, but the requirement from the European Union is that the UK as a whole make 95.24% of payments. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, given that those figures one would assume are accurate, um, what financial penalties have you been notified of, um, the scale of them, um, and whether you actually accounted for that um, within your thinking? Thank you very much. Um, the process is still ongoing. So the, Europe, the process in terms of the European Commission formally uh, confirming final numbers uh, to the UK, and then there's a process by which the UK has to decide whether any penalties that are applied, uh, how they're distributed across the UK and the different nations. Um, our understanding of the current situation is that uh, there's been, that there may well have been sufficiently good performance across the UK as a whole to mean that uh, for the main schemes uh, there are no penalties. Obviously that's uh, not yet confirmed and we should uh, always be cautious until we have final numbers. There are some of the smaller scheme elements where there may be some small level of penalty. I don't know, Eleanor, if you wish to say anything more about that. Yes, if I can add to some of the details. So, as Liz said, um, at a UK level we believe that for the BPS and Greening scheme, the 95.24 target uh, was was reached, so the, we are we are fairly confident we won't we will not be penalties in relation to that. And indeed, the BPS and greening payments make up of ninety eight percent of the pillar one payments, so that is the vast majority of the of the payments. We will we do anticipate some modest penalties for the VCS schemes because they are Scotland only schemes, and we did not make the ninety five point two four percent. And for young farmer, young farmer is a U, across UK scheme, so we do anticipate modest penalties for that. But as Liz said, we haven't been notified of any penalties yet by the by the European Commission. Okay, when you're anticipating modest penalties, what what kind of scale are we talking about? So, for example. Um, the, across both schemes, we're anticipating penalties of less of, of around half a million pounds, between half a million and seven hundred thousand pounds. Okay, um, and it, let me just tease out the our performance relative to the rest of the UK, because it sounds as if what you're telling me is this is one of the benefits of being part of the United Kingdom that other areas outperform Scotland, and consequently we all avoid penalties. Would that be correct? It's correct that Scotland did. We achieved payment performance about 90% and the other paying agencies achieved much higher, higher 90s, which evened out across the country, yes. Okay. Would you have information on that that you could perhaps send into the committee? Um, the, fine, the numbers, because of all, as we've explained at committees before, um, be before you get to the very end of the payment period, the, f the numbers aren't confirmed and it can take some years. We haven't, for example, finished the 2015 payment period yet. Across the UK, we haven't finished the 15 
because of things like transfer of entitlement, because of probate cases. So it takes a long time for the numbers to be finalised. So we don't we tend not to publish final figures until everything is cleared because the numbers go up and down, the denominator changes, the amount of value. But of course we can we can uh, I will check with the coordinating body about what information we're allowed to share at this point in the year, but we'll of course share everything we can. Thank you. I think we recognise that these are estimates and, yes. you know, it'll take years to complete, but it would give us, you know, a, an order of magnitude as to what areas in the yes, rest of, of the UK are performing um, better than, than we are and what we can learn from them. Um, could I ask one, one question before I move on to other members? Um, it, it's been suggested that staff are involved in the recovery of loans and that is actually diverting their attention from processing the new payments. Is that accurate? There are separate teams involved, so this is about identifying the resources we need to do the various tasks in hand. That's part of the kind of new workforce planning strategy that we have in place. We identify the works that need to be done at different times, and we make sure we've got the people involved during the weeks and months we need them to do the different jobs. Okay, Colin Beatty. Thank you, Vera. As with uh, so many public uh, sector IT projects, a big part of the problem seems to have been originally on the management side. Now, reference is made to the substantial changes in personnel within the senior management team. Could you maybe give us a little bit more information about that? How have you ensured that there's continuity between the previous management team? What's the mix of skills in the current management team? And uh, you know, how is that going to work going forward? Well, I, yeah, no, actually, you, you've been involved in more detail of the changes down, all the way down through the structure. So, yep. so um Continuity has, has, has been a really important factor for us. The, I, I've been in post now for a year, and since I've taken up post, I appointed a new Chief Operating Officer uh, a number of weeks after I started. We split up what was previously called the Rural Payments and Inspections Division into two to increase the management bandwidth, and we had a, a second Deputy Director uh, uh, take up post at the beginning of the year. So there is now, a, um, a, across, the, across the ARPID division, there are two... Um, senior managers who are looking after that. At the level below that, so the level below the senior civil service, it's at senior management level, senior C-ban management to use civil service grades, um, there is a, a, an enormous depth and understanding of the systems and processing, and we rely on those staff e extremely heavily. Only a, um, a couple of weeks ago, for example, we had a, what we call a C-ban conference that brought all the senior staff together in one place to talk about the year, the year that passed, the year that's coming. So we, we have um, worked very, very hard to make sure that we um, draw on the knowledge and understanding within the organisation of the staff who've been around a long time, even though the senior people involved in this are, are very new. But isn't there a, a core senior team that oversees the whole thing that it has the expertise rep 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 reposing within that team and with oversight over everything. Yes, there is. There is. I mean, there are, there are, I guess there are senior management teams at all sorts of levels, but the, the, the core senior management team of obviously what I would call as ARPID, who, who look after this, is Clean and myself, Annabel Turpey, the Chief, Oper Chief Operating Officer, um, Andrew Watson, who is the Director of the Scottish Paying Agency, and Eddie Turnbull, who uh, heads up the Information Services Division. Um, we are all new, we have all been in post within the year, but, but each of us also have a wide range of people who have been in there a long time, and we draw on the knowledge and understanding. I should say, um, we all, one of the things we have done over the course of the year is draw much more heavily on the knowledge, wisdom and understanding of of the day-to-day -day running of the operations, and that's by the principal agricultural officers and their teams who run the area offices around the country. We draw very heavily on them now. They're involved in the PDCR conversations, the, the control room meetings. They're involved in the governance arrangements to make sure that we truly understand how issues and decisions that we take are going to be impacted locally. What I'm concerned about is, is this really a project team? Is, that, is this the senior members of the project team? who have the skills and experience to implement an IT project. I think the one of the things I would, I would really stress is this, is this is much more than an IT project. Um, there is an IT project within it, but success for farmers depends on an awful lot more than the IT. So the IT is one element to it, and we're using very clear and standard uh, protocols for managing that IT contract and our, and our relationship with the contractor um, and with the business as usual capability that we have within, within our own IT support systems. 
but um, but the uh, the policies that set in terms of how the schemes operate, the knowledge of the European Commission, the, for, the farmer facing people within the area offices, the way in which we manage operational processes, these all matter as much as the IT delivery in terms of the uh, overall impact and outcomes for farmers. So I think what we and of course we've transitioned uh, since we last were here in front of this committee from um, from a program. Uh, structure to uh, to more of a business as usual structure. So I think this is very much now about a f an operational unit which is underpinned by uh, IT and which is very much relates to the policy. So all of that has to sit together, and that's the responsibility that Ellen and the senior team carry across that whole piece. Sure all the problems with this relate back to the IT services. Well, I think the um, Auditor General, uh, and I think that we would share this view. Um, sort of has said on record that, that, that many of the problems, if not all of them, really date back to 2012 and some of the decisions that were taken in 2012. So some of the design choices and some of the things that happened in those early days, the kind of complexity of the system that we designed, um, they've, that, that has had a really significant impact on the way in which we've been able to take this forward. The the IT is just one element to it, a, a very important element, but just one element. I mean, the key thing I'm trying to establish here is this is a project a huge chunk of it is IT. There's £170 odd million pounds in this project. I'm trying to establish what is the capacity of that senior team in terms of being able to implement this. I agree there are other elements, but the whole failure has been on the IT side, primarily. Now, the new leadership team, does it have the experience and the capacity to oversee this project? So I, I, my answer to that would be that, um, as Liz said, the IT programme, Cap Futures programme, came to an end at the 31st of March and it was brought into what we, business as usual, if you like, um, and it is now the responsibility of all of us. It's a government system, owned and run government system, and we are um, obviously responsible with our delivery partners, largely CGI, for making sure that it continues to run and develop as we need it to do. When, when, I think the, for me the appointment of Eddie Turnbull in post um, was absolutely critical in that. Eddie has uh, experience over a number of programmes, uh, a number of IT solutions over a number of years uh, in the Scottish Government and elsewhere. Um, and he has, he has developed since his appointment a, a transition plan about bringing the, for knowledge transfer from the contractors into, I, into ISD staff. Um, and we, he has also introduced a number of uh, industry standards methodologies for looking at how we do system testing, about how we make sure that the the, the, the project running um, is effective. And that there has been, I mean, there have been many, many changes he has he has brought about as a way that we actually run the project now that it's part of our day and day working. The other two elements that I would really, I, I would. Um I would also emphasise is that in putting together the management team that we now have in place, we've also uh, not only have we done the, the things through the appointment of Eddie that, um, that Ellen has described, but we've also sought to increase the, um, the capability around audit and assurance, which is really important because so much of this is about what are the financial impacts in terms of penalties. So increasing that knowledge and skill within the senior team and through the appointment of the chief operating officer, in, uh, in increasing the operational capacity as well to, to run our business processes effectively. Because it is the combination of all of those things that determine success. Um, so we've been very, um, we've, felt, we've felt it's very important to build a leadership team that combines all of those skills. And that's the team that we need going forwards. I, mean, I recognise what you're saying about the different layers of, uh, of uh, management here, but how many people are in the senior management team? And the decision making in that, is that now working well? Is it efficient? Is it, uh, is it, is it uh, able to make the decisions based on uh, good information? Um, I'm kind of hesitant with all this because I'm not seeing a, st a structure that you're describing to me which would be a sort of a typical uh, project team in terms of an IT project of this magnitude. And I keep coming back to the IT side because that is a major part of this. And I realise there's other delivery th parts as well. But I'm, I'm, I'm not s seeing any familiarity as to the, the structure. Maybe two things that we can that we could we could pick up on that. One is I think we should come back to governance actually because I think you're also asking about the governance arrangements and we can come back to that and they perhaps would look very familiar to you in terms of project structures. But do you want to talk about the management structure and, and we could of course send you more information about the organisational structure that Ellen has put in place? Yes. I 
So I suppose I, I'm, I'm struggling slightly with the concept of senior management team because the senior management team operates at all sorts of different levels for, di for different things. With the, and we have a, a, a clear governance structure. I mean, and we, can, you know, we have a clear governance model. Um, we, can, we can share that around. Um, at the, if, would, it, would it help to, to set that out? So at the top level is the, what's called the CAP Steering Executive Steering Committee, which Liz Ditchburn chairs. Um, and there are a range of people on that from within the government, non-executive directors, ex expertise from external from the NHS, uh, for example. Below that, we have the CAP Strategy and Assurance Board, which I chair. Um, and that's at the high level governance within the actual programme. Sitting beneath that, we now have the Paying Agency Strategy Board and the Delivery Board. Um, um, the, CAP, the Paying Agency Strategy Board is chaired by Andrew Watson, the Director of the Scottish Paying Agency. Delivery Board is chaired by Annabel Turpey, Chief, Ex Chief Operating Officer of Arvarpid. Underneath those, we have the Accreditation Committee on Audit. We have the Business Design Authority, which is look very much looking at the um, keeping very tight grip on the change processes, which was one of the problems that we had last year. And sitting below that, there are a range of other kind of working level projects, project boards. So there is a very um, recognisable in, in project and project management uh, um, portfolio management terms, a very clear structure of, of working. Sitting sitting alongside that is what is the senior management team arrangements for the whole directorate, of which the, the various bits of ARPID are involved in. Um, so I, I, I'm confident that we have a robust governance system that is taking the right decisions at the right time. And we are making a difference. Gavir, it might be helpful for us to understand a little bit more about this because I'm still a bit concerned about this structure. And maybe if we see it on paper, we can understand it a bit better. OK, I think we're getting the nod that that will indeed happen. Yes, of course. Very okay. happy to. Thank you. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to actually uh, just stay in the same sort of area, but look rather more retrospectively. Uh, there have been significant changes to the leadership team, and the Auditor General's report and some of the answers you've given suggest that the tanker is starting to turn, perhaps. Uh, but isn't that a tacit admission that the old leadership team failed? The, the old leadership team got us into this mess. Uh, so is that an admission? And in any event, who has been held accountable for this situation? Well, I think we've been around this ground before in, in the committee, and I don't think our retrospective view has changed. Um, and uh, as, as the Auditor General said, again, the, the roots of these challenges go right back to some of the choices that were made very early doors. By whom? Um, as we've said in this committee, by, by, some by ministers and some by officials, uh, some by the European Commission. Uh, you know, there's a, as we've described in this committee before, there was a whole set of things. We, uh, we had to try and design a system before the, before the European Commission had finalised its regulations. Uh, we made some decisions that uh, gave a higher level of complexity to the schemes that were running in Scotland for good policy reasons, for, for, for clear, to achieve clear policy aims. But we, we arrived at a system with more complexity than some of the uh, uh, other parts of the UK. Um, those decisions were taken, uh, as is known, by, 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 by ministers at the time. Um, they were taken in consultation and discussion with stakeholders, including the NFUS. Uh, the Europe situation in terms of the, the time, the, the, the difficulty of trying to design a system while the regulations themselves were not yet um, formalised is also well known. All of those factors contributed um, to a, a very challenging situation for the management team that was in place at the time. And I think, as we've also described to this committee, uh, uh, the, the, the history of this project is a, a series of, um, from some very difficult routes, a series of cumulative problems that add on to each other. So every time you are, you're, because you're trying to deal with live payments, because you haven't got, the, we don't have the luxury of saying, well, let's just pause everything for a year uh, and, and try and get this system back and running, because we have to try and provide farmers payments. So we are all the time trying to manage a live system and manage getting payments to farmers as indeed we need to uh, as quickly as we can with trying to stabilise and improve the system at the same time. And that's the challenge that the management team had. And but that I don't tells think me a... why. That tells me why. Yeah. It doesn't tell me who. Who has been held accountable for this? As we've described before, there are there is no single point of failure that you can describe to in this. That so says... nobody has been held accountable? The, as I think you've asked this question to the Auditor General as well, who, 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 is, who, who I think has really considered these points. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, there is, you know, the roots of this problem lie all the way back. Yes, and we are all uh, being held accountable that. all the time. Uh, well, let's look at, uh, you would presume except that the contractors are at least in some way liable. 
Uh, we looked, uh, or in the Auditor General's report, the CGI contract that uh, Ms Mitchell uh, referred to has been extended for two years at a cost of £29 million. Uh, there is a contract with another supplier which had been extended uh, at a cost of, I think, about £3.5 million. Uh, do you have any comment on why we are extending contracts of companies that apparently have failed to, to deliver what they were asked to do and whether that represents an appropriate spend of public money? So as the, um, as the uh, audit uh, report tried to describe, I think, uh, we are um, th one of the challenges of managing a contractor in this situation, and as the, I think uh, the evidence has been given to this committee in the past, this whole project has gone through different phases of being led by Scottish Government with the contractor only operating as a supplier of personnel, directed and, and fully uh, with, with Scottish Government accountable for, the, for, for, for what they do and how they do it, um, to pay periods where the, the contractor was under much more normal circumstances uh, of a normal contract and held to account for that. We've um, had different payment process um, in, in place. You might want to say a bit more about this because I, I, I may not have all the detail. Um, at, at different phases. So there is no, there is no single thread. Um, the model that we've used, the business model that we've used has changed, and that's changed the accountabilities on the contractor. What we can talk about now is how we've increased um, the commercial accountability within that contract, the kind of penalty systems that we've had in place. We've had those systems in place from the beginning. As I said, we then changed the business model so that actually the contractor was only supplying personnel. We've then gone back to a system where we are able to apply penalties and have that sort of um, normal disciplines in place. But one of the challenges has always been that um, unless we, as government, can specify very, very clearly the requirement that we're asking the contractor to deliver, then uh, well, we need to work with things like time and materials contracts and systems rather than a kind of payment by output. And that's uh, why we haven't been able to do that, why we've had to maintain time and material systems for longer than we might have wanted, is because of the very nature of the, the challenge that I already outlined to you, the fact that we didn't have regulations clear before we had to design the scheme. So we've always been almost trying to play catch up with um, getting to a situation where you've got a very clear, very clearly defined requirement which you hand on to the contractor and they can be held fully to account for that. That's the situation that we're trying to move into and indeed have made significant progress in moving into it, but it is still made more complex by the interdependencies of what we need to do as Scottish Government in the business processes and what the contractor needs to do in terms of IT delivery. And this comes all the way back to the, to the original point that this is not just about IT delivery, it's much more complex than that. Do you want to say anything more about the commercial...? Yes. Well, well I was just going to add to that that um, we commissioned an independent technical assessment review, um, which was commissioned from Fujitsu, and we took um, we worked with Fujitsu over a number of weeks to look at um, whether or not the system was working. I guess the, very, the, the baseline question was, is this a system we can ever develop and build on, or is it something we'll have to write off and start again? I mean, that, that would be the absolute... You know, that, that would be the catastrophic solution. What the Fujitsu report said was that there was a, a, a basic fundamental sound architecture there, although it did acknowledge a number of defects in the system that needed to be fixed. But as we were going through that process, and I was very, very in, early into the jobs, I guess, into the post, one of the, one of the first questions I, I was faced with was, well, actually, do we continue working with this contractor, this contractor who, who, who we had worked with in partnership for a number of years, who had a real deep and depth of knowledge and understanding, um, and do we do we want to? We all recognise things needed to change. I mean, CGI recognised that as well. They have um, invested heavily in new management structures, as, as the same way that we have in the government level, to try and move things onto a different footing. And we have moved on to a different footing. I mean, I can give you some stats on how things are improving in terms of both the quality of the releases we get um, and the timeliness of the releases now. Um, and that's a that's a, a new way of working with them to understand on both sides both the business requirements and the IT requirements and an acceptance that we or are an agreement that we we are absolutely looking for a, a high quality product that we can implement and that will work uh, first time. Um, so doesn't I, that suggest, if I may, they, they, doesn't that suggest that something went wrong before at the contractor level? And if that is the suggestion, what steps have been taken to recover the public money that was paid to the contractor? Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure you could categorise it as something going wrong. I mean, I, I, as Liz said, I think, I think the history and the catalogue of the decisions around the um, the CAP project all the way through would mean that it's so difficult to identify 
you know, at any given decision or at any given point, it would be so difficult to, un to understand at what point was you know, a, a wrong or a bad decision taken because the decision was taken, decisions are taken with the best information known at the time. So, so we launched a project without knowing whether it was going to work or not at a cost of what's now 178 million, didn't we? Well, the system works. The system worked last year. It got 90% of payments out by June and 99.7% of payments out by the 15th of October. The system works. I think it it's doesn't work as we would to want it to work, this but is it a works. Working model. Um, but just looking at last year, there's obviously the loan scheme. Uh, yeah. And obviously I'm pleased with the loan scheme because at the end of the day, this is people's livelihoods uh, that we're talking about. Uh, but I am interested. Uh, government has a finite budget. The loan money must have come from somewhere. And if that's correct, what has not been procured, what has not been funded as a result of having to cross-fund the loan scheme? So, as I think um, uh, is clear in the in the report, the, the the budget from which this comes is a budget which funds a number of um, pro a number of uh, programmes across government. It's the financial transactions budget, uh, and that financial trans transactions budget is utilised by a, a different range of programmes. Some of them are, are demand driven. Across the year, they're always very difficult to predict. Um, for example, some of the ones which involve housing depend on conditions of the housing market and how, how much demand there is to take up some of those schemes. So at the beginning of the year, uh, our finance colleagues will be projecting uh, what they imagine the demand may be and how the forecasts will play out over, those, over, those, over that year. Uh, but it's not a situation where you have a very, very clear set of projects which are absolutely on particular paths. It's a much more fluid um, budget line in, in the sense of uh, the, the demand can change over the year. So what we do with our finance colleagues when we were able to express the demands that the, 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 that a cap loan system would place on, on that budget, they were able to look at their latest forecasts, they were able to look at their projections forward, the kind of flexibility they have at the end of year, um, because this is money, of course, which does come back to government, so it's not expenditure, it's, a, it's only about, uh, it's about the profiling of, of, the, of the money going out and the receipts coming back in. Um, and and the, the the needs of the loan scheme fitted within the updated forecasts and the and the kind of uh, projections that we have for the second half of the year, for example. So we did not. Re so as a result of the cap loans, we didn't require any other programmes to be curtailed. So there was basically a situation where the the the, the normal in-year fluctuations within the demands on that budget allowed there to be sufficient room for the cap loan to happen. And can I add to that? So the, when we did the loan recovery for the BPS um, 16 schemes this year, we worked in very, very closely with finance for the, uh, the 31st of March deadline, and they gave us a, a number, I can't remember off the top of my head, something like £115 million. They said, that's what we need you to recover. And we worked with them on a daily basis, making sure that the payments went through and to hit the right number that they needed for the, for the loan recovery. So we... Um, the money does come back. Obviously, the money comes back into the system. It's a loan. So, I, th my understanding is, is, is as Liz says, there was no, there was nothing that wasn't done because we required cap loan schemes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Willie Coffey. Thanks very much. I wonder if I could, uh, before I ask a question or two on the IT side of it, just come back to the disallowance uh, issue that was mentioned earlier. Um, the information I've read, although you can't find very much information about this system down south was that DEFRA were themselves preparing for substantial disallowances and fines of potentially up to £180 million on this system, and that their system had overrun as well, substantially in terms of budget. Um, Liz, you mentioned that our system in Scotland is much more complex than the one being adopted elsewhere, so I'm, I'm pleased to hear that if both systems are, have made substantial... It sounds as though they've both made substantial progress to potentially avoid those substantial fines that were mentioned. Is is that the case? Has there been a, a late run of performance, in a sense, by both systems to try and uh, avoid any fines from the European Union in this? I think, as I understand it, most of the much of the challenges that the uh, English paying agency has had are date, uh, date slightly back. I'm not sure of the, 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 the reports that you're seeing. Um, but the, uh, the English paying agency had very significant and very, very well known in the media um, uh, challenges around their, their own system uh, and, the, and, the, and cost overruns within that system. That was some time ago now. And, uh, and in fact, in England, uh, they made uh, one of the biggest shifts that we've had to make in, 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 in implementing this CAP uh, programme has been moving to area-based payments. 
And as I understand it, England moved to an area-based system slightly earlier. So they, in a sense, went through the pain of that uh, in an earlier cap period. Uh, so their current performance has been, has, been, has been more stable and has been better. They did have uh, more challenges in 2015, but as we understand it, everything that we're hearing is that 2016 has been a good year for, for, uh, for the English paying agency. And of course, it's by far the most significant one in, in numeric terms. So it's the one that sort of shifts the overall balance on the UK performance. If, if the English agency does well, then, then, the, then the overall UK performance is likely to be high. Equally, if the English system does badly, then the overall performance for the UK will be brought down. It is by far the, the, the largest component. Mm -hmm. The, the, the figure that you mentioned, uh, and maybe it was Eleanor that mentioned earlier, of potentially £500,000, which is a Scottish component, but previous figures we heard at this committee were as high as £60 million. How come there's such a huge gulf in that additional risk? There's two, there's two different two things. Figures. Okay, you go first. Right. Okay. Two so there's, the, there's late payment yeah. penalties, which is the penalties that are incurred when you're late making payments, as the name would suggest, and then there's disallowance. And disallowance is where the 60 million um, estimate from the Auditor General came from, and that's on the basis of an assessment um, that's made of, as to when auditors come in and review your systems and processes, your um, the inspection regime, things like your um, the, the controls you have in place, they make an assessment as to whether or not you might be disallowed on certain f factors. And so they're two different numbers. So is that other number still potentially in the system? So the, so the Auditor General has made, they have, Audit Scotland has made an assessment of up to 60 million. That's a, the figure that they put in their report. We we don't make any assessment of disallowance. I mean, we we believe we make um, we carry out the regulations to the letter. We believe that we do them appropriately and on and um, to the letter of the law. So we, we don't consider that we will be. We will face any disallowance, of course. Every year we do face disallowance, but it's a long, drawn-out process of negotiation with the with the European Commission in terms of the, the level of that. So we and we don't know yet. Is it is the answer? Can I perhaps just come back to the late penalties? What I think, for just to make sure for full disclosure that there's no uh, no confusion about the years. So we've um, the year that Eleanor is talking about is the current year in terms of this most recent yes. payment performance. Uh, whereas we say we hope that uh, and believe that the UK has done has done well enough. We still have outstanding the 2015, any late penalties arising from 2015. And this committee will, will remember that we gave a previous estimate of 5 million for potential penalties for 2015. That still remains an estimate. Uh, we still don't have the final information on that. Um, but I wanted just to make sure that, that, that you were aware of that as well as the, as the more, yeah. as well as the information for the 2016 year. Okay, can I just Willie, come? before yeah. you move on to IT, if you've finished with it, I just want to pursue that a little bit further, because my understanding um, for the 2015 figure of £5 million is that's an assessment of financial penalties for late payments? Okay. Yeah. Um, have you made an assessment of the financial penalties for basically disallowance because of weaknesses in controls? No. Can, can I ask why? Because one of the clear committee recommendations was that you conducted a full yes. assessment of financial risk. So we have done a full assessment of financial risk and we take risk into account in decision making much more fully. But in terms of, in terms of disallowance, um, when audits are done by the European Union, by the auditors, they come over, they write a letter to us and they, they would give us some assessment of what they think. And then there's a, it's a negotiation, basically. Um, auditors would say they interpret the rules in a particular way, we've perhaps interpreted them in a different way. And there's a, a point of discussion and, and, and negotiation between them. So my assessment would be it, it would be inappropriate for us as a paying agency to, to say because we don't, we do not believe we have um, implemented rules incorrectly, so we, we wouldn't assess that we would be liable for any disallowance until we are told otherwise. So was the Auditor General's report wrong? Well, can I, no, let me, let me no they, they, have, they have taken a different method. They, yeah. have, they have a methodology that they work out looking, so they look at um, the previous audits that have been done and they take an assessment of the issues that the auditors that have raised and they say, well, that might attract a particular level of penalty and it's a perfectly reasonable thing for them to do. But as a paying agency, it would be inappropriate for us to, to, to say up front, we believe we'll be disallowed on the, on the methodologies we've put in place. Okay, can, so can I, it, yeah, it, just I, so let I me pursue this yeah. point then I'll absolutely yes. let you 
come in. Um, so 60 million is a reasonable assessment. But what you're saying is because you're still in negotiation, you're not going to confirm or deny whether there's going to be a disallowance. Uh, I would say that 60 million is an assessment that the audit the Auditor General has made on that. I, whether it's reasonable, whether it's not, I wouldn't comment on. Undoubtedly, the Scottish Being Agency will suffer some form of disallowance. So at what level that will be, I think 60 is on the very high end of what it will be. We've never been disallowanced in anything like that before, but I guess time will tell. And this is the first time you've done it? Cap future payments, this is the first time you've yes, operated indeed. a system. That's true. So, you know, there is no history. There is no history. OK. Might I just yeah, let okay, me finish well, this point and you can come in and yeah, address no, well, them well, let all. Me, let now. me, on, on that point, it is important, as Eleanor says, a lot of this is about do we understand the rules and do we apply them appropriately? And, uh, and there's no history, you're right, there's no history on this particular CAP system. However, there is a history of many years of Scotland applying CAP rules of whatever the CAP system is at that time and suffering, in fact, lower levels of disallowance uh, than some other parts of the UK historically. So what we have is a track record of understanding whatever the European scheme is at the time, understanding it sufficiently well to apply those rules effectively in ways that we're able to defend to, to the European Commission and argue sometimes they may have one interpretation, we may have another, they allow us to put evidence forward, etc. So we have a track record of being able to demonstrate that we can uh, apply rules appropriately. Now, the rules may be different this time round, but I think the capability to understand those rules, apply them effectively through our systems, is still uh, pertinent. OK, so the failure in 2016, given that you have all this ability to apply the rules effectively, the failure in 2016 was down to... But do you mean failure when you say in terms of late pay payment penalties? Well... Late payment penalties, and did you learn from the control weaknesses? So there are, there, are, there are very, very many different things going on within this. There is a very clear system around late payment penalties. That's a simple test. Did you make the payment on date X or did you not? Mm -hmm. Okay, and, of, and, that's, and that sort of sits within a very clear bound. Um, as, you, as the committee may well remember, there are then these questions of you have a 5% allowance that you can use post a certain date, a 2% allowance post another date. But there's very, very clear, and it's black or white. The payment is either made or it's not. Disallowance is, uh, and the broader categories of disallowance are very often, um, are very broad and varied in terms of the nature of the questions that the European Commission can ask. So it includes lots more things which are far more qualitative. They're not black and white, did we make a payment on day X or not? They include things like, have the scheme rules been applied appropriately? Uh, some of those things are points of interpretation which we will debate with the Commission. Uh, they may also include um, control weaknesses, were the, were the inspections carried out effectively enough, etc., things like that. But there are a very different set of categories of types of, uh, uh, of issues. That It's not as simple as saying, we were late in payments, therefore we'll have disallowance. That's two quite different things going okay. on. C can I come okay. in just to clarify that point? So the, I think I, my, under, my interpretation of the question you're asking was, did we learn from the past? Yeah. So the certifying audit 2016, which looked at the cap payment year, the overall conclusion of the report was that there were no major findings of weakness in the Scottish Government's administration of CAP funds for the 2015 scheme. However, a number of intermediate findings are being addressed, and I should say we are absolutely not complacent about that at all. We have um, a number of, um, within the governance structure, we have a number of working groups in place, which is taking each of the main areas of, um, areas where we weren't found to be, well, areas where uh, issues were were found, and we've got a, a, gr a group which is um, focused on making sure that our performance this year is better than it was last year. Um, and in fact, the I think the, my understanding is the 2017 certifying audit is now underway. So we, I would hope that that would be it would recognise that actually we have made some significant improvements in the areas where um, both internal audit and audit Scotland found that we, there was improvements to be made, and we are absolutely not complacent on that. OK, can I refer you to paragraph 60 of the Auditor General's update report, um, which mentions some of the weaknesses in the controls. Um, and of course, this was published in June 2017, so it's very current. Um, do you accept all the failings set out in paragraph 60, given what you've just said? For the benefit of the official report, shall I maybe read some of them out? 
incremental nature of developing and implementing the rural payment system has affected the quality of the audit trail during 2016. Paying agencies' focus on delivering core compliance functionality has meant that the audit trail is not always easy to see or access. Delays in delivering the new system impacted significantly on the paying agency's planned programme to make BPS payments to farmers, crofters and rural businesses. Um, and I can go on, but you know the, there are serious control weaknesses identified by the Auditor General in paragraph 60 of her most recent report. So yeah, I recognise all of these. Yes, of course I do. Um, I should say that the, the, and we are working hard, we're not complacent, we're working hard on all these issues. Um, I should confirm that, say that the European Commission confirmed there were no financial corrections required as a result of the, the certification audit. So the paying agency is, is I mean, the, the, bottom, the bottom line is, can the Scottish paying agency continue to make payments to Scottish farmers? Yes, we can. We, you know, the, the certification audit identified that there were um, um, no major findings or weaknesses. Um, clearly, some issues are raised, some serious issues are raised, and the, we are working on them. On a, on a daily basis, we are working to improve our position. OK. Can I come back to... And then, sorry, Willie, I'll, I'll let you back in. I just want to pursue this, because you talk about um, the assessment of risk from financial penalties is now an embedded feature of our governance arrangements. What does that mean? And when will we be publicly um, able to see this? So, for example, we have an introduced a new commissioning process. So, for new pieces or, or change requests or new pieces of functionality that are required, there's a new commissioning process in place which goes through a number of governance board, eventually comes to the CAP Strategy and Delivery Board, where a, a key piece of information that is sought is how does this impact on our, on, on, uh, does this improve um, our um, auditor assurance processes or does it put, does it bring it in, in is there a risk at attached to it? And so it is a key part of our decision-making process. Will they be publicly available? The commissioning process, I would happily share the commissioning process forms, yes. OK. I think it's the, the risk assessment in particular that we're interested in, because um, clearly, whilst you may have internally made an assessment of yes. um, the financial penalties for disallowance, you're not sharing that with us because it's part of the negotiation. Um, can, I, can I ask, what do you budget for? What have you budgeted for, for 2015 um, in terms of disallowance? What are you budgeting for in the future? And surely the risk assessment would lead into that. Can I, can I start on this? Because I, I do want to come back to your question of did, did we disagree with the, with the Auditor General? It's really important to say we absolutely agree with the Auditor General and the Audit Scotland report about the importance of risk assessment and the need to maintain, mitigate the risk of, of financial penalties. It, and we have absolutely embedded in our governance processes, as I think the Audit Scotland report recognises. I think where the difference, if there's a difference of approach, it's that um, we are trying to do a set of things that enable us to form that risk assessment, but we are not seeking to quantify it into a single number or a range of numbers, uh, particularly with respect to the disallowance report, r disallowance rather than late penalties, for the reasons that Ellen has outlined. Um, but uh, and so I think again we're not going to uh, we're not going to uh, be able to provide you with a single number. Um, and what but what you you rightly you know are challenging us on is are we clear that those risk assessments are informing the decisions we're taking, which we believe they are. Are we aware of the uh, the potential implications of those, which we are. Are we budgeting for them appropriately? Well, the budget doesn't work in that sense, in that um, until we know, it's a very long drawn out process, the final liabilities for, for example, the 2015 scheme uh, are not even, you know, we're nowhere near to the conclusion of that yet, and there's further audit work to be done and then subsequent negotiation. Um, the point, um, I understand from my co finance colleagues, the point at which that risk were to crystallise into an absolute number and a request from Europe, and we have exhausted the opportunities to reduce that through further evidence, that's the point at which we would need to uh, bring that into our budgeting. But it would come into a, into a future year, not into the, uh, the, the current year, as it were. Uh, do you want to say anything more about the, about the financial aspects of that? The, uh, or perhaps not? But the only thing I would add, and I was just looking for absolute clarity on the number, um, my understanding is that the accounts that are um, will be published this year, there's a, 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 a um, allowance of a million pounds um, for the CAP 15 year, and that will be because of the, the actual late payments that we made. 
So you had a risk assessment, I'm now confused. You had a risk assessment that said 5 million, but what you're saying is there will be something in... in it's because of what it's, been, it's when the issue... So the, the, as Liz said, it's the issue between... It's the status of it, it's the issue of when, of when a, a, a risk materialises. OK, so there's a million in the current accounts? Accounted yeah, the for... The accounts are currently draft. In the draft accounts. In the draft accounts. So there's a million in the draft accounts, but more to come. Possibly. In future accounts. Yes. And we don't know the number. Yes. Wow. Willie Coffey. I'd almost forgotten what I was going to ask Sorry, you. sorry. So, so long ago. <laughs> um, I was wanting to ask you about looking ahead from this point on. Eleanor, you mentioned that we're at 99.7%. And Liz, you did mention some critical IT functionality. I just wanted to explore that a wee bit more and to try to understand what are or what is or what are the critical factors that will manage this process in the years to come? Is it is it IT? Is it components of IT that we need to be in place, correct and working, to ensure that we don't face these particular issues in the next few years? I, I think it's that it's the IT and business processing. It's the annual business cycle. One of the things we've been working on very hard this year is to match the the agricultural cycle with the um, the SAF, the application processing cycle, and the and the kind of broader business cycle around the requirements of things like inspections and the like. So I think, I mean, it, it's a mix of all three. It's making sure we've got the right staff in place with the right skills to do the jobs that we need them to do. It's making sure that the IT system is working to its optimum level. It's finalising the um, getting the additional functionality we need in the system at the time we need it. So it's a combination of all three. Where are we in, in being able to say to the committee members and to the public at large and to the farming community the software is completed, it's ready, for next year this will be on time? Where are we in terms of being able to say that? Are we still finalising key components of this IT system? Yes, we system? are. We still have... When do we think they'll be? Well, we have a, a, a detailed delivery schedule of IT, which we're more than happy to share with the committee, which sets out when the, the various bits are likely to be delivered, both in terms of the Cap Pillar 1 payments and the Cap Pillar 2 payments. Um, as with any IT system, uh, with any major IT system, there is an ongoing range of maintenance we need to do every single year, the SAF form. It's what's called the rollover, so we do need to change the dates. Rules change, for example, greening rules change in Europe this year. So every single year there are changes and amendments and upgrades we need to do. So in a, in, as with every IT system, it, it is an ongoing process. In terms of the base functionality, we've talked before about the, the cost of CAP futures of £170 million. Um, an amount of money, um, around £11 million, um, was brought forward from last year into this year. So in terms of the completion of the bits that cost us £178 million, the cost of the system, that will be finished in this financial year. Now, you mentioned that, and, and I'm pleased to see in the report that we have in front is that there are new testing processes in place, there is quality management going on, there are less defects emerging from the software. Are you becoming, are you confident, are you becoming more confident that the system is settling down and stabilising to enable this process to be done correctly, properly on, and on time? for the next round of applications? I'm cautiously optimistic. <laughs> we, have a, we, we have, of course, the independent technical students, which uh, identifies that there are there is a significant amount of technical and production debts. And we have a, a joint team in place with um, members of ISD, members of I, uh, Scottish Government, and CGI working on making sure that we are, well, we're, first of all, we're triaging them. We're making sure that they're, actually, they're, they're real, they're affecting payment performance, and um, if they are, we're dealing with them. In the last six months, uh, I think we reduced the technical debt by something like 40%, and we're not adding to it anymore because when we when we release put new releases into the system, we, we're making sure that, there's a, that they're defect-free or we're working to, to make them defect-free. Um, so I'm cautiously optimistic, but um, I, there is there is a lot of work to do. I mean, I'm really proud of what the team are doing, really, really proud of what the team are doing and continue to do to make inroads and improvements in the system, but um, it's a journey. 
think I, I want to... It's really important to highlight the technical assurance review because this time last year when we sat in front of this committee, some members asked us if this system would ever be fit for purpose. And um, we said that's a really important question, which we absolutely need to know the answer to as well. We can't just go forward in, in, in hope and faith. Uh, we have to absolutely assess whether this system, you know, it, in, it, in, it, in warts and all, its strengths and its weaknesses. And that's what the technical assurance review was about doing. And it was good to hear that the system's design and infrastructure was fundamentally sound. Uh, many areas of improvement and, and, and problems and legacy from previous changes that, uh, that we need to sort, but that the system's design was fundamentally sound. It does provide a basis from which we can continue to improve and, and, uh, uh, and develop the system. Thanks for that. I'll let other members come in, Jackie. Okay, Bill Bowman. Thank you, convener. Um, as new to the committee, I'm picking up things as we go on. So maybe just before I ask my specific question, can I just uh, make a couple of comments on the penalties that I've been hearing about? Uh, you know, when you talk about the disallowance one of 60 million, I mean, I can understand how your negotiating position would be. We have done everything correctly, but in the real world, you have to make an assessment of where we stand and what may may come to hit you. I'm not asking you to put that out here, but I would like to think that you actually do that. Um, when, when you spoke about the late payment penalty of half a million to a million, I think you used the word modest. I would think that seems quite a lot of money to many people. It's maybe just the wrong terminology um, to use um, when speaking about a payment that we get no value, value for. But anyway, moving on to the paper that I think you submitted um, on the update, if you have that. Um, the latest update. Yes. The one that's got um, a point one a section update on progress and the, the last sentence, there are appropriate disaster recovery solutions. Oh, sorry, the, 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 late, the letter we sent to the committee on the 30th. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Do you see that sentence? Yes. Yeah. So there are appropriate disaster recovery solutions in place for our two separate platforms. The disaster recovery position is constantly developing and forms a feature part of infrastructure planning and application support. So I, I just wanted to clarify for myself what that actually means. Have the disaster recovery solutions actually been fully tested? And secondly, what does constantly developing mean? Because that doesn't sound like something that's stable and working. Um, and what is a feature part? Eleanor may wish to say more in detail, but let me uh, say a couple of things by way of introduction. So the first thing to say is that the new system, the, the, the future system, the, uh, which is the, the, the rural payments and... Um, oh, I never forget, I always forget the S's, the rp &S system, um, has a full disaster recovery system in place which meets the standards, um, uh, and it, uh, it, we expect restoration of service within four hours from that system. Your question, has it been fully tested? It has been partially tested. It hasn't yet had a full kind of almost go live, um, you know, to take everything out and see if it, if, if it, if it works, um, full emergency, full, full scheduled emergency exercise type testing. That's because of, uh, of challenges of, of timeframes and fitting everything else in. But, um, but it has been tested to a significant extent and it was designed absolutely along the standards that the industry would expect for a full disaster recovery system. So that's the main system, that's the new system uh, which is working to, to make our payments. Uh, as the committee will know, there are a number of legacy systems which we're still using because some of the challenges in earlier years meant that we had to delay the implementation of some of those other systems. One of them is the land parcel information system, LIPIS, um, uh, and there's another system which, which, uh, which is the SIAC system. Those legacy systems do not have the kind of the same kind of full disaster recovery system that the new part has, but they have full data and system backup. So that backups are held off-site so that we can recover and restore uh, all of that data and systems if we need to. But the times that those legacy systems would require to be recovered are much longer. So what the, um, uh, although we have tested to make sure that, that those backups actually do restore from tape. So what the team is doing is working through <coughs> um, the levels of risk that we're prepared to take. So those legacy systems will, 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 will be replaced. And the question we have to ask ourselves is what would it cost to put in place uh, a full disaster recovery system for those legacy systems when some of those legacy systems will only be working for, for example, a number of months uh, and we have to assess that, the risk and the cost of doing it. And that's what the team are working through. So they're assessing what are the mitigations that they can put in place to improve the disaster recovery of the legacy systems. 
uh, and where can they make decisions around that. And I don't know if you want to say any more about that, but I wanted to describe the shape of the overall um, way in which we're approaching this. I don't want to add any more to disaster recovery. I just, I, I suppose I just want to say that in, um, you remarked on the late pay penalty. Um, and I suppose that my, my use of the word modest was just in reflection of the, the fact that it was modest in relation to the hundreds of millions of pounds that we actually pay out as a paying agency. But um, that is not to detract from the fact that we should be making payments in time. I absolutely accept we should be making payments in time. And actually, I, 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 I am... You know, I, I regret the delays that farmers are experiencing in relation to the, the monies that we haven't got out the door yet. Yeah, thank you for that um, comment. So just moving back to the disaster recovery then. So what is constantly developing? What part is constantly developing? Is that the legacy part? Yes, the risk assessment of the legacy. And we need to uh, risk assess not just uh, in the abstract, as it were, but risk assess against particular payment processes. So the risk um, may depend on whether there's, the system is exposed to particularly high volumes, for example, and my understanding of what the teams are doing is that sort of dynamic risk assessment and assessment of the options that they have. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, that, that's, that's an appropriate way of dealing with the risk on the legacy systems. Uh, what we absolutely need to do is be clear that we are taking uh, risk-based decisions. We're explicitly accepting a level of risk and deciding whether we can tolerate that or whether the cost of mitigating it is too much. And of course, it's critical to think about the length of time that we're exposed to that risk. So if these legacy systems were going to be working for another 10 years, then without doubt, we will probably choose to do some different things. Knowing that they're going to be replaced, we have to, uh, we have to assess the trade-offs of carrying a level of risk uh, currently, uh, but when that risk exposure stops. So the future system, you said, has been tested to a certain degree the, the, the future system we are um, we, we still would like to be able to do a full scheduled emergency exercise we have not yet done that uh, we do need to do that at some point but we are confident that the that the point new system time. I don't have a I don't have a date I don't know if you do. we haven't got that schedule and as Liz said it's because um, but do we mean of, of a month three months a year in terms of when we will do it mm -hmm. My plan of when we would do it, so at the, at the moment, it's, it's to do with, so we've done desk exercises. Uh, we, have done, we have done what we, can, what we can do and what we can reasonably expect to do without taking the whole system down and doing full disaster recovery. And the reason we've not done it is, and this may sound melodramatic, but actually the system is operating all the time. We are always working on the system. We are always getting payments out. Partly, as Liz says in her introductory statement, this year, 2016 payment has been a very fraught year. Um, and actually, this is maybe the, the point to pay tribute to the tremendous dedication and work of all the staff all, throughout all the country who work on this day in, day out. Um, we started late. We, um, we had a number of uh, changes to make in the system. Um, and it, we have been literally working, making payments on an almost daily basis the entire year. So it would have been inappropriate, in my view, to take it down to do a full disaster recovery. Will 17 be any better than 16? Um, Possibly not in terms of staff workload and because we partly because we're introducing a new LIPIS system to try and improve our land management information, the holding of information on land on a land based system that's clearly very important. It was highlighted as one of the key controls that we have identified as, as not being right in all our audits. We're taking action on that, we're doing it this year. But it does mean that the system is constantly under pressure. Now I I, I know what that means in terms of disaster recovery, but actually I think there is a so the, the, we, we are constantly assessing the risk of that. But um, my assessment would be we will continue working with the system as it is um, and we will disaster recovery at, test it at a time when it is not under so much pressure. Um, convener, I mean, I don't want to pursue this because I don't perhaps have the technical knowledge, but you know, perhaps you could perhaps come back to us. What is the technical guidance on um, you know, a backup testing when the system is not available to be tested. You know, what is the best practice in the situation? So, so like my understanding, that? I think it, we would like to come back to you with more detail, as you said. So it's a very technical subject uh, on which I'm also not qualified. My understanding, but we should uh, confirm this to you and give you more information, is that the design of the system and the nature of the uh, of the tests that we have done do meet the standard. I'm afraid I don't have the standard in my head. It's, it's one of those uh, uh, one of those numbers. Um, I thought I could find it on the piece of paper, but um, but we should write to you with more information you, about if that. If you did quote it, <laughs> do I have time to ask another? Absolutely. Quick question. Okay. 
Um, moving down on the the um, the paper that you you presented, item two, I think, bullet four. If you so, the one that begins develop a benefit realization plan. <coughs> Do you want to speak to you, well, I just can I ask, did you find it there? Yes. You have it? Yeah. Yes. So develop a benefit realisation plan to record and monitor all potential benefits and value that the system can provide. Now, is this something you have begun with or is this something you've accepted to do? I'm just interested to know what might be all potential benefits and value. So there was, clearly there was a business case um, done at the beginning of the CAP Futures programme and as is normal practice, so towards the end of it, at the end of a programme you would look at it, you would review it, you would um, update it, you would have your final position before we go into the gateway review process. So that, that work is, is underway, recently started, underway. Okay. Do you know any of the potential benefits and value? Uh, the work's just started. Will we hear about that at some point? Of course. Okay, okay. okay. Alex Neil. Just a couple of uh, short questions. Uh, convener, can I first of all refer to Eleanor's um, updated management report dated the 4th of September 2017? Can I just say, make a suggestion? It'd be useful actually uh, to add a column showing the percentages so that if you take the BPS, for example, the value of payments made to date, what is that as a percentage of the, the total? And write down, and the same for the VCS, but that's a, a suggestion. Am I right in a suit? In my calculation that um, you say in your um, letter that you remain on track to issue the payment schedule to all our customers by the end of September 2017. By my calculation on the BPS, there's only 3% of payments outstanding between now and the end of September to achieve that target. Is that right? On Yes. Yes, so we have... Yes. So, uh, well, at the end of as at the end of August, we were on um, ninety nine point three percent of the BPS scheme, um, which includes VCS, and we've been, we have virtually well, we've completed the beef scheme such as we can. There is there is always uh, tail payments, and the the VCS sheep scheme is the one we can't complete until we've completed the the BPS payments. So but, that's the one. So yes, we have. But there's a subdivision here in the support of the BBS from the VCS. Now, the BPS says the number of eligible applications is 17,990 and uh, the BRN pay whose payments have been processed to date is 17,509, which would suggest 481 outstanding payments, which would suggest roughly 97%. Uh, so you've got three percent to catch up on that particular on VC one. On yeah. BCS, yes. Right. Okay. Yes, we have three hundred and twenty-one outstanding BPS payments. Yeah, and yeah. and that will you're, you're fairly confident those will be met by the end of September. We will do all we can. I mean, as in every year. I mean, there are payments we have. There are, as I said at the start, there are payments because of probate, because of all sorts of issues that are exceedingly complicated. But we will get to the, you know, the, the just the very, very, very tail end by the end of September. I'm confident of that. Okay, and uh, that's the percentage by the number of applications. Uh, in terms of the percentage of the value, is that roughly the same kind of percentage? It's roughly the same. Right, okay. So you're fairly confident you'll get near, as close as you possibly can, reasonably close to, to 100%? Yes. Right, good. Now, see specifically the VCS payments that are highlighted at the bottom part of that um, report. Um, the Suckler Beef Support Scheme um, for Mainland, the one for Ireland, and the Scottish Upland Sheep Support Scheme are each of those at a similar kind of percentage. and. Are you as optimistic, uh, Eleanor, about getting those completed by the end of September? So we, as I say, the beef scheme is complete uh, now. Um, the, we we are, so we we have achieved over ninety nine percent overall uh, by the end of of August. We are, um, we've made good progress over over the summer on these, and we are con we, we remain on track to get to. to just down to the very, very last few tail of payments by the end of September, yes, on all, across all schemes. Okay. Pillar one schemes. Right. Okay. I, and my second very short question is, you see in your paper, again referring to paragraph two, uh, bullet point five, 
um, that um, you're prioritising uh, that you communicate clearly with the payment timescale. The, the, clearly, the, you communicate, you communicate clearly the payment timescales and processes to farmers, crofters, and rural businesses. If we did a survey of farmers, crofters, and rural businesses today, I, I know what the result would be up until recently, but if we did one today, do you think the, the majority of them would feel that that's been achieved? Uh, the visibility of when we're going to make payments. Uh, the communica clear communication about the payment timescales. Because one of the one of the issues clearly from the NFUS and yes. and others uh, individually was uh, <clears throat> apart from the core issue of the payments themselves was the communication. Uh, uh, communication so yes, a few things I'd like to say on that. So we are we still clearly intend to publish a schedule of payments um, for for next year. The reason the reason I have been uh, reticent to doing it up to now is because I want to be sure that when we are setting out a payment schedule, that it's something that we can we can meet. Because what I hear when I go around the country is what farmers, uh, farm businesses really really want is is assurance on the on the dates. So of, clearly they want their money and they want it as soon as they possibly can, um, and that's entirely appropriate. But actually, the, the main thing they want they want surety of of timing. Um, we haven't been able to produce that until we have a clear delivery IT delivery schedule, um, and that has only recently um, we've only recently firmed that up. So we're now in the in the final processes of agreeing what the dates are we can commit to to uh, delivering information, um, and we and that will and we will publish that as soon as we as soon as we possibly can. In terms of general information, one of the uh, one of the um, achievements the team has made over the course of the year is in the 2015 payment scheme. Payments were sent out, and then at some at some point later in the year, payment letters were sent out. So people were receiving money in their bank accounts and were getting letters um, detached from that. In the 2016 processing year, we sent out payment information letters at the same time as people were getting their actual amount of money. So I think we have demonstrated that the information available to farmers is better. Um, the the in terms of Another issue that um, came up has come up in conversation with the NFUS and with, and with individual farmers is understanding and knowledge of their, their entitlements. Um, now, all all entitlements are now shown on the on, on online on the screen. So, if a farmer were to log in, they would see very clearly what their what their entitlements show. So, I think that's another piece of information that we have worked hard to make sure that people can can access more easily this year. Okay. And have you done any complaints from them about communications issues? I mean, what's the level of complaints about that specific aspect of the problem? Well, um, when I was rounding about the area offices over the summer, um, they would say that um, they get very few, um, they have had very few recent phone calls about payments. Um, now, undoubtedly, the loan schemes helped with that because people had had money um, and weren't waiting for the money, which is which is very good. Um, so the, the level of the level of calls into area offices has been generally pretty low over the summer. And can I finally just come on to to, to the loan scheme? Um, is the loan scheme being operated um, separately in the sense that um, the loan is obviously given pending the award of the grant? Yes. When you then calculate the amount of grant a farmer is entitled to, do you deduct the loan outstanding? Uh, so they get a net grant payment net of the loan, or do you pay the full grant and then in parallel take steps to recover the loan? I'm almost sure we pay it net, but if I'm right. wrong on that, I'll come back to you. Okay. And can I ask, have we, there may be cases where the loan exceeded the grant entitlement. Yes. So is that different differential recouped? So the well, two things I would say on that: the BPS loan schemes are fixed, fixed um, at a certain percentage. The LFAS loan schemes are up to a certain amount, and that reflects the the variability. Um, and quite detailed calculations are done by the loans team in advance of offers of loan being made to try and avoid that very possibility. So because no one wants to have money that then 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 they have to have to be recovered. But yes, there are occasions when recoveries are do have to be made, and that's often because of penalty that have been applied on farms. But um, the team do. Um, high levels of, of, of checks and calculations to make sure that people aren't offered too much money as a loan. So two questions arise from that. Firstly, um, would it not make more sense to give them an advance 
partial grant payment rather than the loan, which clearly is a completely separate form of administration. And that would, that would be my very, very strong and clear preference. Unfortunately, we're not allowed to do that because um, under EU regulations, under the rules, you have to have done all your um, inspections and processing of that before you're allowed to make an advance. Right. And we, 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 we don't plan to finish our inspection processes until December, this year, until December, which is significantly better than last year, but December. Um, so we can't therefore make an advance payment. Yeah. This is the same EU that hasn't had their accounts endorsed for 30 years, by the way. Uh, not your fault, their fault. Um, the final point is, in terms of the loans, um, is has there to date been any bad debts? And do you anticipate the provision of any of bad debts on the loans? As far as I'm aware, we have had no bad debts, what you would call bad debts, right. to date. Okay. And no provision made for them. But if that's incorrect, I'll, I'll write to the committee. Great. Thank you very much. OK, Monica Lennon. Thank you, convener. Um, we've talked a lot already about the process and the procedures. I want to just touch briefly on the people who are behind the scenes or you know, public facing who are um, powering through. Um, I think both of you have recognised how hard staff are working. I'm sure they'll be pleased to hear that acknowledged on the record. But I wonder if you can give committee some reassurance that, that staff welfare is, is being looked after. I think in previous sessions we have asked about the impact on staff and their well-being and I just wondered over the, the summer period in particular has there been any um, restriction on staff taking holidays? Has that been difficult to manage? I wonder if you could talk about the capacity and the team to cover holidays and, and sick days. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't pay enough tribute to the staff not in Sockton House and in every area office around the country. People have, uh, you know, their dedication to the task is is uh, is something I've never come across before in in all the jobs I've done in the Scottish government. So I would pay absolute tribute to them. I take welfare um, um, of of my staff, welfare and well-being, very very seriously. Um, I I. Um, as I say, I've been round all the area offices, um, and obviously I work. I'm based in in Sockton House. I talk to staff regularly about how they're feeling about things. I talk to, I I look at our regular stats on absence management. I look regularly um, at the flexi levels that people have. Um, there is nothing in that that causes me particular concern at a global level. Our absence levels are roughly the same as the rest of the Scottish government. Um, our Balances and flex there are roughly the same as uh, the rest of the government. The ability of the carryover of annual leave is roughly the same as the rest of the government. So I, I would say that um, I would pay tribute to the um, principal agricultural officers in that regard. They, they work closely with the staff. They, they look at the work scheduling across the year. They have very, very clear timelines. Um, I think um, some members of this committee and REC committee have visited uh, some offices here in Hamilton over the summer. They'll have seen the detailed plans in offices which says these are the tasks we need done this week, these are the resource staffing resources we need done this week, and everybody is encouraged to make sure that they take their holidays at the times they want them, they plan them in. Of course, we still ask people to do overtime at some points in the year. Um, staff do it willingly, they do it gladly because they know it's making a, having an impact. But one of the things I would say this year that has been better than last is um, we we have been clearer um, about the peak periods of times with area offices uh, closely in conjunction with them um, about when staff time might be needed to process applications and that's partly because we um, are much more rigorous in engaging and talking to and, and, and valuing the knowledge and understanding of area office staff as to what they can actually do because some, this, there are periods of time when actually there's nothing area, area office staff can do in terms of processing the forms. So they can, they can manage their other work at that time. So we are clearer about the work processing, work planning, and, and, and my assessment is that is really beginning to help. In terms of overtime, because that's something that, that you just mentioned there, um, has there been an increase in overtime and how does that compare to other parts of government? Um, no, uh, overtime levels are remaining pretty static over, the, over this year and last. Um, it, it is well managed at a local level by the, by the area office staff. Okay. So when you say that everyone's working really hard, are you just meaning within the sort of norms of a normal working week? Yes. Because I, I, I got the impression people were perhaps, you know, having to work round the clock and, and go beyond the call of duty. So um, things are so I mean regular. The, well, people are people are working very hard, and people are feeling it, it is a stressful environment. Um, 
to, to where people are knowing that they're having to take phone calls from farmers, for example, if payments are late or people don't understand the letters they're getting. You know, I, I recognise and understand that can be that can be very stressful. And um, what I have asked the um, principal area of um, agricultural officers to do is to make sure that they, they they have systems in place to make sure that the the staff know that they can come and talk to people if they're feeling stressed and anxious about the conversations they're having, if they if they find it difficult. I mean, I I can't underestimate. Um, because I've never worked in a in a in a small in a in a, in a small office, um, but people tell me you know it, it can be very stressful if you're for example in Tyree you're one of eight people you live in the community you work in the community you're meeting people in the supermarket you meet people when you pick up your kids from school, and if there are problems in us if you have problems in the system you're working in it it can take over your life I understand that. We have had people who have who suffer with stress because of because of work. We take that very seriously. We offer high degrees of support uh, as an organisation, um, but we we do our very very best to manage it. And um, everyone in the organisation would recognise, I hope, that I take well-being and welfare very seriously indeed. I think one of the the risks that was identified previously um, when we heard from the Auditor General was the idea of. Um, burnout and, and what would happen because that, that would mean probably bringing in more agency staff and that would have another cost and again the, the work environment isn't really you know a pleasant one for anyone but you're not overly concerned that you know there, there has you said it's a stressful environment but are staff impacted by that stress or are you not seeing any real evidence of that? So one of the things we have done uh, this year is looked at um, um, the vac vacancies and um, we've looked at skills and uh, we've looked at jobs and um, where people have been um, on temporary promotion for a long period of time and we have a, a, a resourcing plan in place we have um, taken steps to recruit um, a, a num to recruit a number of key posts um, we have recruited um, there's been a, a whole a new in influx of agricultural officers of land management teams um, and that that has that's had a really positive impact on staffing numbers in area offices. We've also looked at, as Liz has mentioned before, the skills we have in terms of audit, in terms of finance. We've recruited staff into those posts. Business management, business skills, we've recruited into those posts. So we've taken a very, very uh, proactive approach in saying what are the skills and um, capabilities we're needing across the organisation. And I've been very upfront and open with um, all my deputy directors and um, all the CBAN staff ask them to be very clear about what resources they need to do the job in hand. I'm not asking people to work 24 hours a day. Um, I want people to tell me the resources they need and the skills they need to do the job. And then we would go out and try and source the resources for them. And our first port of call is always within the Scottish Government. OK, no, thank you for that. I wish all the staff well and those who haven't had their holiday yet, I hope they get one soon. Can I just follow that up? Um, and whilst I would never be in the business of denying somebody a holiday, um, let me ask you about knowledge transfer, because that was a key recommendation picked out in the Auditor General's report. So I'm wondering in this busy you know, work environment, how we're ensuring that key contractors transfer their knowledge to Scottish Government staff, and what is the end date for that? Yes. So I think the first thing to say is one of the is a recommendation we absolutely uh, agree its importance and the risk that if we don't do that well the the, the risk that would come from that. Um, uh, I think the, the one of the reports actually also mentions we'd already identified uh, some of the most critical contractors in terms of the people that hold the most knowledge that mm -hmm. with, without which we would um, uh, and they hold that knowledge personally. Um, there's work shadowing arrangements in place for those critical contractors so that uh, so that knowledge is starting to to pass over. Uh, and I understand all contractors now have a plan in place for knowledge transfer. Those plans are at varying stages of implementation. That's partly because uh, there needs to be someone to whom, to whom that knowledge can be passed. And that's partly about the recruitment schedule that, that Eleanor's also talking about. But I think it's fair to say that uh, we absolutely are on the case on this. Uh, there's been some good progress, but there is still some way to go. Um, I, I, and I, the other thing perhaps I would say is I think it's really the, the maturity and the, the way in which the contractor team and the, and the Scottish Government team work together has really developed over the year. Um, uh, Eleanor and I were at, were at an all-staff session with all of the CGI staff contractors um, and the fact that it feels like one team now, it feels like there are these integrated teams with, with people from contractors and, uh, and uh, Scottish Government working side by side. And of course, there's very, very formal knowledge transfer, but actually the knowledge transfer through working together and through working on common goals is also very significant. 
Okay. Well, if you could give us an update on that as the work progresses, that, yeah. that would be much appreciated. Um, in the absence of questions from any other member, can I thank you both this morning for coming along and giving evidence to the committee? And I suspend briefly to allow... Oh, I'm going into private session, in fact. There you go. So we'll go into private session. Thank you very much. <laughs>